transforming and healing yourself and uh, the attitude of gratitude and that's where these ladies have come in my life and i've come in their life and we work together with everyone and anyone out there looking to grow in life personally maybe they have epilepsy or a dis-ease i call it as wayne dyer taught me something's not right in your life and you want help out there or you want to know you're not alone so we have a wonderful group i want to introduce liz nichols liz how are you doing today i'm doing great how are you doing great as always Awesome. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Liz Nichols. My company is Liz Nichols, a woman in motion. Um, I have a history of epilepsy. And what I did was there wasn't a lot of resources out there or support or help when I went through uh, my epilepsy many, many years ago. So I designed or built a business that would provide resources and coaching for those with epilepsy. And uh, that's just a bit about me. I'm up in Canada. And I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm so glad that Stefan and Stacy and I came together. It's been an amazing journey. Um, and I'd like to introduce my friend Stacy. <laughs> Good morning, Stacy. And I'll pass it over to you to uh, introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. This is Stacy Chalemi, and I am a health. Uh, lifestyle and epilepsy coach. I work with individuals to help them um, retrain um, their their mind, body, and and spirit uh, to change uh, to help them with their epilepsy to show them how they could re redo things in their life to help them cope and help them live a happy, healthy, and productive life with epilepsy. I'm the founder of the completeherbalguide.com, and I am a very big advocate about about um, uh, eating the right foods and also, um, you know, using um, different types of natural herbs and supplements and also changing the way we live to help with our epilepsy along with taking medications or doing other um, things to help uh, improve our seizures and hopefully get our seizures under control. So today I'd like to introduce to you um, Bob Foy. Uh, he is a huge friend of mine and I love him to death. He is a huge advocate for epilepsy. He's been doing this for a very long time. He's accomplished many things. He's he's uh, very much into uh, helping with the political aspect of epilepsy. He also has a lot of projects that he's involved with to raise money and to do different things to help people with epilepsy. He's known nationwide for his accomplishments. You mentioned Bob's name and people know exactly who he is because he's done so much in the epilepsy community, especially in Connecticut. His Home, his home state to help people live a better and more productive life with epilepsy. He's very much into the politics and end and getting certain types of uh, things approved to help people in the epilepsy community and doctors and other professionals are very aware of him and work with him and he's just a, he's just a wonderful person with a lot of knowledge and experience in the epilepsy field and I'm very excited to have him today on the show. And how are you today? Great, and thank you for having me. Yes, we go back just over today? a decade. Great, and thank you for having me. Yes, we go back just over a decade. we finding each other on Facebook and uh, been friends ever since. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the introduction. The Connecticut Epilepsy Advocate is a recognized 501c3 organization. As you said, we're based in Milford, Connecticut. We serve all 50 states, and that's something we're very proud of. We just have a completely different point of view from these other epilepsy organizations that have been around forever. And we feel that's one of the things that makes us different. That and the fact that our board members, myself, no one gets paid. We have a wonderful professional advisory board with a wealth of knowledge and they cover so many aspects, whether it's epilepsy, insurance, helping with finding your correct medication at a better price, and we even have a, a gentleman that does insurance uh, for whether you need a better policy, retirement, any facet of insurance. But Stacy, the one thing you mentioned as far as the Connecticut epilepsy advocate and the being political, we do that to a degree. One of the things that we really have been focusing on year after year is the high cost of prescription medication because it is beyond ridiculous and yeah. who can afford it? 
you know, I, I've, I've dealt with that myself. My medications uh, run, I take three different medications for epilepsy and I take along with that, I take Diamox, which is a water pill to help with epilepsy. And my medications run between $1,500 to $1,800 a bottle. And, um, you, you know, when they had tried me on generic, generic medication does not work on my body. And the difference between it is that when you have generic versus brand, the difference is it has the same ingredients but the coating on the outside of the pill has a different time release. So sometimes the generic pills will go through your system quicker and the time release is not as slow. And for me, um, generic didn't work because I needed a slower release in my system. I needed it to stay longer in my body. So the only medications that helped control my seizures were the brand medications. And I had to go through a lot to get those brand medications approved because because, you know, my doctors and his community had to write letters to get them approved. And each year we have to go through the same process. It's very stressful and it's also very nerve wracking because if they don't get it in time and they don't want to pay it, I'm responsible for between that fifteen to $1,800 a bottle. And the other medications are not going to control my seizures. There was a time when, you know, they gave me the generic medication when I went to the pharmacy. And they're like, oh, this is, you know, this is fine. It's the same thing. This was years ago. And I didn't realize, you know, the difference. I was like, oh, okay. I brought it home. I took the generic. I had seizures right away. And, you know, the, there is a big difference between brand and generic for me as a, you know, personally. So, you know, if I, if the insurance companies don't want to cover it, I'm, I'm basically screwed, you know, because, you know, it's those brand medications that are controlling my seizures and it does play a big impact. You know, I need a slow release in my system. And, you know, I said to my doctor one time, I have a, a very well-known doctor who's known nationwide for his accomplishments. And I said, what happens to these people who can't afford these medications? Because I spend, still with my insurance, I spend $75 a bottle for my medications. And I said, what happens to these people that can't afford it? And they are, they, you know, my doctor replied, they are, you know, different ways to get medications, you know, um, if you can't afford it. But I don't know if they're going to give them the brand. And I don't, you know, and what's the process, you know? What happens to these people who can't afford $75 a a, a bottle or something to that, you know, aspect. Yeah. Well, actually my Kepra and Lomecto, the brand, if I didn't have my wife's insurance and I had to pay for it at the drugstore, the average range is from 1100 to 1500 a month. So you take yes. that number times two times 12. One of the things that you mentioned as far as working with some of the manufacturers, they do offer programs depending upon your income range, whether you have insurance or not. And we said to a lot of people that are married, you might have to get a friendly divorce <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, file, uh, to be able to apply to the program. Right. And as far as political, there's a wonderful uh, congresswoman upstate, not in my district. So we were working on a national bill to lower the cost of prescription medication, that, whether it's an epilepsy or not, that's irrelevant. So she says, oh, we already submitted the bill. I says, can I see it please? They're like, of course. So I explained to them, I said, number one, you said you submitted the bill last year. I said, so that's in limbo. It, you're never going to see it be brought up. I said, number two, your bill addresses Medicare Part D. I said, not everyone's on Medicare Part D. Exactly. So it really doesn't help. Mine, what I put together, as I said, doesn't matter what medication you're on, is that the biggest thing we're fighting is the tier level. And it should be simple. If you have a brand and there's no other generic, it's tier three. If you have a brand and let's say 10 or more, excuse me, five or more uh, generics, drop it down to a tier two. If you have a brand and there's dozens and dozens of generics, then automatically it's a tier one and the copay is zero. You can't make it more simple than that. And back to something else you said with the filler, Years ago on the public access channel, they show what goes on in our state capital in Hartford. And the paid lobbyist was being asked questions and filler came up. So he says, what's the percentage of the filler? He goes, ah, what's the difference? Five, 10, 20, 30%. It does make a difference. It and does. I'm like a paid lobbyist, I can say that 
My example is if you would follow the national average for ethanol in your car and put a cap on prescription medications, I can almost guarantee you that if it was at 5%, more people would be able to take a generic. Because as you know, the generic medication follows 100% of the brand formula. However, with no cap on the filler and every filler is different, mm -hmm. that, that's the issue. Yes, you know, I have, go ahead. Oh, a quick no, question, because I went through this in 2004 or five, you made a good joke, but it was my reality. I was a divorce that actually helped because if we were still married, it wouldn't have qualified. And I went through Cobra. I don't know if Cobra is still around in the US. It what is. Talk about? Okay, so that helped me. And I was seeing those bills too. It was like 1800, uh, I think it was Topmax or Kepra, uh, Tegretol, whatever the expensive ones were, I was seeing that and Cobra was covering all of it. Cause I had basically lost everything, had nothing to show for assets and qualified and Cobra got me all the way through brain surgery two years later. And, you know, I had like a thousand dollar copay for the, the brain surgery, but that was it. So I was very mm -hmm. blessed. I think maybe discuss that if it's Cobra or other things like that, that would be good. Yeah. But you see, even whether it's Cobra, Obamacare, whatever insurance that's out there, people brag about how great it is. And it's like, well, read the fine print, talk to the agent, then you see what the deductibles are, uh, how much how much you have to use before you get complete coverage on your medications, your doctor visits, whatever. Some right. people have, you know, like a $5,000, you know, mm -hmm. um, deductible. So, you know, what happens when that person doesn't have $5,000 in their bank account to, you know, spend on a, on a monthly basis, or even if they have to go for MRIs or CAT scans, you know, if people have a large deductible, then it's going right to, you know, you're, you're paying out of pocket, you know, in the U.S. So, you know, dependent on the person's insurance. So, and it also, you know, for people like myself, Myself. my husband is a doctor so he is responsible for paying for our insurance and we work together as a team but still you know it's it's you know coming out of our pocket our insurance we don't work for a corporation you know so we don't you know the corporation is not funding our insurance we're paying monthly our own insurance so not only are we paying our own insurance I'm still paying my own insurance and I'm also paying a high, you know, copay for my medications. And I also have a deductible as well. And, you know, so it, it, it is very costly. So not everybody is married to a doctor and not everybody is, you know, as successful. And those people who are struggling, you know, day, you know, week by week, you know, there are some huge, you know, difficult um, aspects that, you know, they're, you know, challenges that they're going through. And, you know, it's not addressed as as much and the insurance companies don't want to pay a lot of things and you have to really fight for it and you have to if you have a good doctor and you have a good hospital or university that support you know clinic that supports you know epilepsy they will do their best to get it approved but it is a very difficult aspect because not everybody understands how to approach the healthcare system not at every you know and they don't know you know what they're entitled to and what they're not entitled to because it's something that's not not really um, a topic that's not really educated in our society. You know, um, up here in Canada, when I got epilepsy, I think I was 21. Um, and okay, so let's going back 40 plus years. Um, and it was so expensive to have epilepsy between, um, you know, your medications, uh, some recovered, some weren't. Uh, oh my gosh, just everything. I tallied up approximately what my additional uh, medical expenses were over like a 20, 25 year period. And it was massive, massive amount of money between, you know, going to naturopathic doctors, getting medications, seeking out, you know, alternative holistic or, you know, anything that would make me healthier mm -hmm. and help out. And, you know, without a word of a lie, huge number amount of money that I don't I won't even say publicly because people would be shocked right medical was yeah so you're right Stacey too I remember now it was a flashback that I probably deleted because it was so stressful but living with my parents at 34 years old the Cobra did have a five thousand dollar copay so I remember right. January through March April it was stressful they had to pay we I had to get a loan even one time 
And in order to hit that 5,000 mark, and then I was like, okay, good, I made it. By April, everything was covered. So that very stressful for a lot of people like that, even with insurance. And especially now with inflation and going through, you know, um, everything that we're going through, the, you know, there's a lot of, you know, things financially in our country. People, you know, prices are up and, and you know, people are struggling to make ends meet, you know, having to deal with, you know, the struggles of maybe paying their mortgage or paying their rent and having to buy food and pay for utilities and then have to worry about getting their medications because it gets very nerve wracking because if I don't get my medications, my seizures aren't going to be controlled. You know, I use holistic, you know, um, along with my medications, but I need the combination of both. You know, I'm not going to, my seizures won't be controlled unless I have, if I'm taking care of myself holistically and I have my medication as well. So those two things combined. So, you know, making sure that I have that medication, making sure that, you know, that medication is paid for is a huge stress. You know, when I see the pills getting low on my bottle, I have to call them, you know, and, and, Re, and and you know and schedule a, a new bottle, but also the med, one the, the one of the medications I take Amphi is you know they don't carry a lot, a lot of it because not many people in my area take it, so I have to call ahead of time. I have to make sure it gets here on time, and I still have to pay. I'm pay, buying three drugs at seventy five dollars, and I'm buying a water pill, Diamox, and you know it's it's a lot of money. And it's amazing you brought up Onfi because years ago they had a program and it's about a just over a year now that there's a generic for the Onfi. So of course that cost is high. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, that, that you brought up, I'd like to bring up uh, political again. We spoke to uh, some people in DC and I had said, we want to reintroduce this bill for prescriptions. And my idea was I want to get five congressional members for, you know, from the four time zones who in turn could find five others across the country. And what it would be is you stand up in front of the media with a bill proposal, a hundred members are there. That's going to draw some attention. Yes. You know, it's, it's people like you who actually help make a difference. And even, you know, the epilepsy community, I was speaking with one of the, one of the doctors that I, I work with, who is, uh, he, he's known nationwide for his accomplishments. And I had mentioned, I said, oh, Bob wanted me to say hi for you you know, hi to you. And, and he's working on, I was telling him some of the projects you were working on. He goes, if anyone's going to get it done, Bob will accomplish it, you know, because, you know, you've done an amazing job, you know, letting people you know, become aware in our society, especially in Washington, what people are going through. And, you know, you know, I, the problem is, is that, you know, the, the pharmaceutical company is now starting to understand, you know, but they've only touched a small base of a patient's perspective. You know, they have to understand what these patients are going through and understand the struggle of getting these medications. Because once they understand, have a full understanding of from a patient's perspective, what they're going through, they can maybe help us, and, and you know, financially and help us, you know, and educate society on ways we can get the proper medications at a, at a reasonable cost that's not going to break the bank for a lot of these people. Because like I said, for me, I can't take generic. I have to take brand. So I have no choice, you know. So, you know, there I'm sure there's people out there just like me that it's, it's, it makes a difference. So, you know, this is something that we have to bring awareness to and I'm glad that you are bringing awareness because we need more people like you that are you know making them understand you know that people are struggling people need help and you know that you know more needs to be done through the insurance company and through the pharmaceutical companies you know they have to work better with patients that need you know a lot of help, you know, because not everyone is doing super well with their epilepsy. A lot of people are struggling. I just I was talking to a friend of mine. He just got brain surgery today because his seizures were so, so severe. He still lives with his parents because he can't move out because his seizures are so severe. He needs to be with somebody. So people are struggling. People need help. And, you know, it's pharmaceutical companies and the healthcare system has to be more understanding and they have to be more compassionate to people 
people that have these needs. The other thing I brought up, and I totally agree with you, the other thing I brought up is the fact that you should be able to find an insurance carrier outside of your state mm -hmm. because it, you, you can make a purchase of an item and have it shipped to your house no matter what state it is. So why not be able to choose an insurance carrier outside of your state? Your state can only cover so much. Right. And there's really not too many. Here in Connecticut, I believe there's only six or seven insurance companies. But if you, if you say, well, I found my uh, Kepra over the counter is a thousand in Connecticut, but Texas has it uh, for 300, then they're going to counter and you're going to have that competition. Yeah. Now, now they're in a conundrum. They have to go around and say, well, if you want us, and it's going to make them lower the price. Yeah. And it's amazing Great because point. every facility has a different price. You go to CVS, they're charging X amount of dollars. You go to Walgreens, they're charging X amount of dollars. You know, you go through the pharmaceutical company, they're charging X amount of dollars. But then I get nervous going through the pharmaceutical company because what happens if it doesn't get here on time? What happens if this happens or that happens? You know, so it's, you know, I like to know that I can get my medication. I have access to it and that, you know, it's not going to get lost in the mail and, you know, things have gotten lost in the mail plenty of times in my area. So it's like, you know, I'm afraid to get it mailed to me. I physically want to go somewhere and say, I need this medication and have it ready for me in 15 minutes, you know? So it's, 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 it's a, it's, it's, it's a struggle. It's, it's nerve wracking. One of the, I'm glad you brought that up. One of the things that uh, started with me with COVID-19 is we were telling people now more than ever, use the 90 day mail order with, with any program you can and mail order or over, over uh, to, on a monthly basis, we tell people have your doctor write a new prescription in November or the first week of December. And we're asked why is that now your prescription carries over into the next year and especially with mail order. So you have your 90 day, 90 day. So in November you received your 90 days, the new one comes in and the next batch gets sent out. So you're never going to run out. Right. The other thing we recommend is keep a small bottle aside, e either in your pocket, uh, whatever. And Good that point. way that's your backup. I mean, how many times I, years ago we were out, I'm like, oops, no medication. <laughs> and I, I made, I stopped that forever. The one thing that we tell people is that you should get a medical alert bracelet, have it registered with all your information. Because ironically, if you're walking around with any medication that's not in the prescription bottle and mm -hmm. you get pulled over, in many states, you can be arrested for possession of drugs. Yes. We took a, a class with the Milford Police Department and I asked them, he says, honestly, he says, in this bottle, it's meaningless. So I showed him my medical alert bracelet. I says, here's a number in the back. He goes, what does that do? As you call the number and you say, I, I have patient ABC123, I said, the records are pulled up because, well, if that's the case, then you're covered. Yes. And they're starting to come out with apps also on the phone to do the same mm -hmm. thing. So, yeah. you know, if you're not wearing a medical bracelet, it's a very good idea to wear a medical bracelet. But now we also have certain applications that are coming out. They just came out an application last year as well that you could put all this information on your phone and you'll be able to pull it up as well. Even with the Empatica 2, the uh, smartwatch mm -hmm. and the others. We always yes. tell people, even if it's in your phone, you, you can put the information there, just like your ICE numbers in case of emergency. We've spoken to many uh, police officers, state officers, whatever, a fire department, and we've shown them, go into a person's cell phone, click on I for ICE. I said, there's your contacts. Right, exactly. You know, we try to cover as much as possibly. I mean, sure, people like you have other things that you address and we help each other. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing, but a lot of people don't know this information. So it really needs to be more, you know, verbalized and, and, you know, in, to the public. And that's why we have, you know, there are a lot of websites also that provide this information, but there, I, you know, 
besides <clears throat> explaining the the causes and the, the symptoms and the, the treatments, you know, um, they do mention resources on a lot of the websites like the Epilepsy Foundation, but I think they need to, you know, explain a little bit more and go into more detail about the medications and about, you know, explaining, you know, how to, you know, just like you mentioned, you know, keep an extra bottle. If you go on a trip, you know, where can we find, you know, a, a medical bracelet or what apps to use? You know, my doctor, you know, ex, you know, you know, gave me suggestions of great apps to use, but it should be more, it should be put on, on more websites to help educate people with epilepsy that don't know a lot of this information. Because believe it or not, a lot of people are clueless in our society that have epilepsy. And if they have more information, it could help ease their life and, and make it a lot easier for them to get the, the things they need so they could actually function better and not ha be so stressed out about all the things that they're going through, trying to not only control their seizures, but also live an, a healthy and productive life as well. There's parts of it too, if you, I can add this, is a lot of people are old school and they don't have the technology. And you made a good point about um, it's local, your local pharmacies. And that's how we were in the 80s and 90s pre-internet. And everything seems to be local in that state. It's such a great point I hear to be able to go out uh, online and order it anywhere. That's what we should be able to do. But I think the, the system is kind of stuck in its old ways to say, well, you have to go out here to go to your pharmacy. But we have pharmacies everywhere now. <laughs> online, there can be more of that opportunity. We do have support groups in each state. We have not only the Epilepsy Foundation in every state and people don't, some people don't even know what the Epilepsy Foundation is, but we also have support groups and, you know, besides the Epilepsy Foundation that, you know, help educate people, provide programs for people, you know, and give people the opportunity to participate and meet other individuals that are going through the same problems with epilepsy. That way they can converse, they can understand what each other is going through. They understand that they're not alone and they also learn things from each other. So, you know, a great way is to try to reach out and find support groups in your area and also support groups that are funded, just like Bob's, you know, um, organizations that are available to you that provide all this information and can help direct you in the right direction. The Connecticut Epilepsy Advocate has a monthly support group via Zoom, but we have more one-on-one. -on -one, and when we find people, we're like, okay, we could speak on the phone or I'll set up because you know you could set up a zoom meeting within 10 minutes and then yeah just bring them in there and you'd be surprised how many people uh, are appreciative of that, of that kind of support and that one-on-one -on -one that the Connecticut epilepsy advocate does is so important to these people Oh, yeah. You know, people sometimes don't like to talk about things about their epilepsy in front of other individuals. Some people are embarrassed. Some people, you know, are just they don't like to come out in the open and share how they're feeling. These are emotions. And, and, and you know, you know, some people are scared about this, that and the other thing. Some people have issues about X, Y and Z. And they're more apt to want to talk to someone one on one that they can relate to sometimes than a whole group of people. So it depends on the personality. So that's great that you have that where people can go one-on-one -on -one and actually get help because sometimes you can open up better when you are speaking with some just one person rather than a group and some people work really good with a group because you're having you're having information you know and you're having discussions and all this support from all different types of people so you know depending on the personality of the individual you know both having both things available is great one of the topics that came up on Facebook, because you know there's these many epilepsy groups uh, regarding uh, Keppra and Keppra Rage, and that drives me crazy. I take Keppra. That's one of the drugs. I take three drugs to control my seizures, and Keppra is one of them. And I get so angry myself. You know, I don't mean to interrupt you because I don't have any of those side effects with Keppra, and they make people so fearful of the drug. And you know, I don't have any side effects when I take Keppra, and it's actually helped control my seizures. So you know, people have to realize that people react differently you know every individual reacts differently to you know medications so go ahead Rob, um, Bob finish no, what you no have problem. to say no it's, I'm glad, glad you brought it up but what we keep putting on Facebook we have this one paragraph typed up regarding Kepra Lamecto the brand and who makes it and we keep asking I said do you eat three meals a day do you stay drink half your body weight in order do you do you take a uh, the vitamins 
uh, the following vitamins, this, that, three meals. You set the alarm on your phone. So a couple of people are saying, you keep putting the same thing over and over. I says, and until people understand this. It makes a difference. Had, yeah. And we've had more people that we spoke to. There's an old TV show on decades ago where you would ask questions. And if, you, if it was a no, they'd say one down and nine to go, two down and eight to go. And when we question people, we're like, okay, we're going to flip the cards over there because we haven't received the yes answer yet. Right. And the majority of the people that we've spoken to in person, Zoom, phone, whatever, when they find out that when they use the different vitamins, they stay hydrated, set the alarm on the phone so you don't forget your medication, they get back to us a week or so later, it says, I notice a difference. Yes. But regarding Kepra and Kepra Rage, whether you're starting it or weaning off it, but especially starting it. We just told a young woman uh, yesterday that give it at least a week or so after you completed the start, when yes. you have the total amount that you take, let everything that's in your body come out. And once it, get, it gets used to it, it, most of the time it works fine. Yes, it does. And I'm glad you mentioned about the lifestyle because even when I was discussing this with my epileptologist, you know, we were talking about lifestyle. That's why I like to teach lifestyle to people with epilepsy because sometimes people just pop a pill but live such an unhealthy lifestyle and they they get mad and they get frustrated because hey my my it, this medicine is not controlling my seizures nothing's happening you know and but then you ask them okay are you getting enough of sleep are you what are you eating you know you know what's what's your daily routine like and they have very unhealthy lifestyle behaviors and when you are taking medication for epilepsy th that medication is going to help you but you, it will help you if you if you live a healthy lifestyle you have to incorporate the two you have to get enough of sleep you have to eat properly you have to make sure you're you're not deficient in certain vitamins you know you have to hydrate just like bob said these are things that make a huge difference in how your medication is going to react because the medication if you your body has stress it will it will can tr trigger a seizure you know it's up to you to incorporate a healthy lifestyle a lifestyle that you know is not going to cause you so much stress a lifestyle that is healthy you know by eating right you know by by doing things that are going to give you the proper nutrition and to to help your your body overall all these things together will help you but it's up to you to change your lifestyle and to make sure you take your medication because one of the biggest things that people do that cause seizures is they forget to take their medication and that's something that has to be addressed too they have a lot of great pill um, boxes with alarms on it because sometimes when you're taking medication every single day you're like oh did i take my medication today or you're feeling great and you forget to take your medication and then all of a sudden you have a seizure so they're a great box medical boxes too on amazon for people who forget to take their medication or to prevent them from forgetting to take their medication as well yeah it was over 15 years ago um i used to walk around looking at the clock waiting for nine o'clock <laughs> one of my nieces uncle bob what are you doing is i'm waiting for nine o'clock to take the medication she goes set the alarm on your phone and ever since then the alarm is set and that's something else we besides uh telling people to set the alarm we always ask them, ask your doctor, what is the time frame? Mm -hmm. In my case, it's every 12 hours. Some people take it three times a day. So ask your doctor, because if you, if I took mine at six one morning and 11 the next morning and it goes back and forth, there's no consistency. Exactly. And that makes a big difference. You have to have consistency. I mean, granted, because I had the surgery, I even have a one hour window, uh, which is fine. But not everyone is that lucky. No. So when setting the alarm, I'm sure the doctor will say, okay, you don't miss it by a minute. Some will say, okay, for your range, 10 minutes before, 10 minutes after. It all depends on the individual. And again, ask your doctor. Yes. And that's a big thing. Go ahead. Oh, Go was, ahead, Stefan. I was Stephane. curious about also addictions and if you help people or have had any stories to tell about. Like, I've been 10 years sober, but alcohol. Uh, drugs, other other lifestyles that people have had. Has there been any help that you've done or do you have any um, suggestions? You know, people are trying to get sober 
and they have epilepsy and they're trying to lead a healthy lifestyle. My issue was forgetting to take the medication because I was hung over or I was yeah. drinking and stupid. I know, but addiction, have you helped anybody like that before or do, do so now? Not directly. We do interact with other organizations that will address that. So we'll introduce an individual to a different organization or we'll the, the three of us, the other, our organization, the other and the individual do a sit down or again via Zoom or over the phone and then they take it from there. But being the person in between and offering what we uh, can, you know, that makes the individual feel comfortable. Usually when people have an addiction, a per, uh, an organization that, that um, deals with epilepsy is not going to be able to help that person. If that person hits rock bottom and wants help because that's the key, then we can address them to go to a certain rehab and get one-on-one -on -one attention or address them to a support group where they can get help. But epilepsy foundations, epilepsy organizations don't usually have the capability of helping somebody with an addiction. It's usually being able to give give them the ability to give them suggestions on where they can go and support groups. And usually rehabs are the best thing. You know, if a person is dealing with addiction um, and they can't cope with their epilepsy and they're resorting to, uh, you know, an alcohol or another drug, you know, you want to go to a rehab and you want to go, you know, find out what the nearest and the best rehabs around your area are, because that's something that an epilepsy organization or a support group, you know, with epilepsy cannot deal with. They don't have the, the, the abilities to help someone because that's two separate things. So somebody with an addiction, you know, there are lots of rehabs in states that will help that person and get that person on the right track. Yeah. See, Connecticut Epilepsy Advocate is a coalition member with Milford Prevention Council. And under that umbrella, there's about 10 other organizations and one of them has to do with uh, addictions. So right away, we have our contact there who in turn will work with someone else. And after that, we just, okay, this is your forte and thank you for helping us and the individual. Right. It's It's been helpful to a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. There's a, the, same, the same thing comes with people in New Jersey. We have, you know, we the organizations in epi, uh, that deal with epilepsy in New Jersey don't deal with addiction, but they have, you know, they have facilities that they know of that deal with addiction that they could direct them to. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, what they're people, for. So, you know, break, I've had people come to me that I have the epilepsy and I play racquetball, for example. One of my friends came to me and said, I had a seizure last week and I said, well, what's your lifestyle like? Like Stacy says here, what are you eating? What are you drinking? Well, I still had a couple beers. And I said, well, cut that out. Now, not that he's an alcoholic, but he can't break the lifestyle habit. He goes out with his friends. He has a couple beers. He has a seizure the next day or two days later. So it's just a lifestyle change. It's got to be, you got to be stronger than your addiction basically and change everything. I'm glad you brought that up. And it's easy for me to say, when I was a teenager, the doctor brought up to me, he said, if you want to drink, uh, it's okay. You can have uh, no more than four ounces a day. Mm -hmm. and I would go out, somebody was dating, it's like, okay, here's your four ounces. I'll finish the rest of it. And it got to the point where we're just getting old. And I'm like, I'm buying it's a bottle of wine. And six months later, half of it is still there. Why bother? So right. I just didn't bother. So people say, well, how, lo how long you've been? I said, not alcoholic. It's just, I don't want to drink. It's that simple. And we tell people all the time, it's easy for us to say you just should not drink, period, because you have epilepsy. But the ill effects it has on your medications. Oh, yeah. And too many people feel the peer pressure. And again, easy for me to say, brush it off. And it's not easy for individuals. But once you stop consuming alcoholic beverages, it does help. And we'll definitely, with that, we definitely do one-on-one -on -one with people. Yeah, my well, doctor told me it, on, on the sobriety part, he, after brain surgery, the seizures went away. Then I started drinking, they came back. And he mm -hmm. said it was later, just like last year, I found out you could have been having the, uh, what are they called? Det delirium tremors, tremors, right? And right. the DTs, because you're coming off of such high levels of alcohol, you're, you're triggering your old epilepsy, but at the same time, it's alcohol related. And every time Correct. I read those Tegretol, Tofamax, no alcohol, I was just like, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know, if somebody asked, you have to be stronger than that and be sober going in and saying, I have to change my diet. I have to stop drinking and, and do it, right? 
Oh yeah, and like I say, it's easy for me to say, but it's very hard for others to do. Usually people have to want to change in order for them to change. Usually people have to hit rock bottom. And a lot of times people, you know, can just have a seizure. They don't have epilepsy just by over drinking and putting their body to a point where it, they just, you know, get to that point where the body, you know, goes into a seizure, but it's not epilepsy. And people, you know, people with that take medication, we have to realize also each medication reacts differently to um, alcohol. And you have to go and you have to be responsible because, you know, there are medications where, you know, you can have, like you said, a little bit of wine, a little bit of the, you know, four ounces, but there are some medications that severely interact with alcohol. Like Anfi, for example, is a medication that does not work well because it's a sedative and it, it, you know, and if you, if you take alcohol with the sedative, you are not going to have a very good um, uh, response to that. It will, it, it, you know, if you even look at the um, side effects, it, tell, it will tell you that it interferes severely with, you know, the medication and alcohol, you know, interact with severely. So you have to, you know, when you go on medications, I suggest that you look at the side effects, you really, you do research about the drug, under, understand what you're taking, and, you know, understand the what triggers certain things, the causes, in, and, you know, just don't take a pill, understand what you're taking, do research, and be your own doctor. You know, when it comes to epilepsy, you listen to your doctor, you have to have good communication. If you want to, if you want to improve, you have to have an honest, good communication with your doctor, and you also have to be your own doctor. Follow, you know, research your condition, understand what you're dealing with, and take proper care of your body. And that's a good thing you brought up because it's what we tell people all the time. If you can't have a direct relationship with your doctor, then I always say, I paraphrase my cousin Vinny, I'm through with this doctor. You look for another one. Yes. Because, you know, I, I, it took me many years to find a very good doctor. You know, not all doctors are um, sympathetic to your needs. Not all doctors, you know, can relate or understand what you're going through. And it might take several, you know, a while for you to actually find the right doctor um, that you could actually have a very good relationship with. But you need a doctor that is compassionate, a doctor who will listen to you, understand what you're, you're, you're trying to explain, and then work with you to find a solution that's going to be beneficial to your condition. True. Sure. One of the other things I found out with some, but not all old school doctors, people come up to us and they say, I'm really out of it. And what do we talk to these doctors? And they basically give the people a ton of medications and they sleep all day. Well, that's not helping the issue. No, not at all. And I, you know, that was one of the things when I was becoming, trying to find the right medication, I was looking for a medication that I can function normally on. I don't want to be on a medication where I'm going to be drowsy or zoned out the entire day that my life is useless then you know what's the purpose of you know you're controlling your seizures but then you're sleeping the entire day you know you're you're wasting away your life you know you have to try to you know work with the doctor and it might take time you, you know it's you can't just stop a drug you can't you have to wean off very slowly with your doctor but you you know keep looking you know I always suggest go to an epileptologist you you know, I go to a clinic for epilepsy and I have an epileptologist. All they do is focus on epilepsy. They're on top of the new drugs that are coming out. My doctor gets a lot of those drugs passed. You know, um, you know, you have to find a doctor that understands epilepsy very clearly and that knows what's going on. As soon as a new drug comes out, that doctor will probably know about it and know exactly, you know, what it can do and if it's the right drug for you and, you know, a doctor that can understand what you're going through. That and the fact that we tell people all the time that have your neurologist and your MD on the same page because one might see yes. something the other doesn't see. You ladies make sure that your everything goes to your OBGYN. So the three of them in, in your case will see because sometimes one doctor says this is going to work, and the other one, wait a minute, you didn't see the side effects. 
That was exactly what happened during my pregnancies. I had my epileptologist on the phone arguing with my OBGYN because I was starting to have grand mal seizures during my end of my pregnancy. And, and the, the epileptologist was like, we have to get that baby out right now because you know something very bad could happen to my patient and to the baby. Mm -hmm. And the OBGYN didn't want to have the baby at eight and a half months. And he's arguing on the phone she needs to be in the hospital right now. She needs to be induced. That baby needs to come out. And I had three wonderful pregnancies all at eight and a half months. But I had my doctor arguing with the OBGYN because the OBGYN didn't understand why the doctor wanted my epileptologist wanted those babies out. So, you know, you have to eat, you know, my best thing would be like if you're deciding on having children or if you have an MD, ask them, you know, do you understand what epilepsy is? Can you work with my epileptologist if you, if you need to? And make sure that there is communication between the two if it's because if it becomes necessary they have to be able to be compliant with one another true I and bob let's let's um, wrap it up here if you don't mind uh this has been yeah. great wonderful topics definitely want to have you on again because everything we're talking about is so related to helping others uh, and tell us about your your business what you do mainly and also just any contact information any upcoming events would love to hear more the Connecticut Epilepsy Advocate uh, just has one fundraiser a year. It's called Strikeout Epilepsy. It'll be next year. And that's the one way we want to bring the money in, get people to meet each other, communicate. And we always use that money extremely wisely. The website, which you can share with anybody, is ct-ea.org. Again, that's ct-ea.org. And the first thing we tell people is, on the website, use the drop down and look at the testimonials. When you hear what the other people say and how how they feel we helped us, that speaks volumes with that. Ding dong. There's the opportunity in life. Ding dong. <laughs> Somebody's doorbell going off. It's that that's wonderful. And I'll put the links here down below on the YouTube channel and right here on everybody can see this. I'm gonna put a little right there. And then what they can reach out to you. So again, Bob, I appreciate it. And anything in closing, Stacy or Liz out there? I just want to uh, remind people that, you know, there is always a solution. Don't give up. You know, there are people in every state that have experienced, you know, ep you know pe there are tons of people in every state that have epilepsy and there are organizations and clinics and, and places you can go to to get the help you need. If you're struggling, if you don't know the answers, don't try to figure it out yourself. Don't always rely on the internet because you don't know if you're, the stuff you're reading is accurate. If you're going on the internet, make sure you go on to medical journals that are backed up by scientific knowledge and and also make sure that you you know reach out to a, a certified organization or you know an an a, 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 an area on the website that you know is certified with the epilepsy foundation and make sure you reach out you know there are people that can help you in every state it's just reaching out don't be embarrassed to ask questions there are people that here that are willing to help you i wouldn't be where i am today if it wasn't for the epilepsy foundation and the organizations that were related to the epilepsy foundation they helped me get on my feet they introduced me to the right people and i i can't say more about the epilepsy foundation and the organizations that were supported by the Epilepsy Foundation, they helped me get to the point I am today. So reach out, ask questions, don't be embarrassed. Yeah, Liz, I was going to say, you're a woman in motion, so tell us more about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, uh, yeah, that's my company, and I provide coaching for people with epilepsy. But uh, I'm loving these conversations. And Bob, oh my gosh, so much good information coming out, because honestly, there was not a lot of help or information or resources when I first got it, you know, 45 years ago. And nobody talked about it. And there was nobody to talk to about it. Um, and it just, it felt like it was a thing I was on my own going through it. And people were terrified of it. Didn't want to talk about it. I guess maybe I didn't really want to talk about it till later in life. And I went, I'm talking about it. People have got to talk about it. They've got to share resources. They've got to be there for others that are going through this journey. Because most people I know that I talk to that, and talk about the epilepsy, they have no idea what it is. For everybody out there, no I think, idea. is like, I feel like going, my name's Stefan and I'm an epileptic, you know, like Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> like you wanted well, to just go to a meeting and talk to people that could understand. 
because they don't and they didn't. And even if you get over it, now I look back in the way it was and it was a lot of denial, a lot of self-destruction by saying, I don't have a problem. This is freaking ridiculous. I can take this medication and I can drink. I can take this medication and I can miss some yeah, sleep. So I'm not like that. You know, drinking and partying and taking the medication. And, you know, all of a sudden I started to realize, okay, Saturday, Sunday mornings between nine and 10 after a hectic week of working, going to school, partying, you know, life in general and all that. And all of a sudden to have a seizure between like nine and 10 on a Saturday or Sunday. Exactly. In every case, there had been alcohol and partying the night before or two nights before. But it took me a while to kind of clue in that, wait a sec, you know, but um, live and learn, right? And uh, uh, I'm just so glad that we're all talking and everybody's talking and, you know, you don't have to be ashamed of it. And yeah. I know I was, and, you know, people don't want to talk about it and they don't want you to talk about it. And they don't understand it. Well, what is it? 50 million people have it. We've got to talk about it. Well, that's where I wrote my book, you know, um, Epilepsy, You're Not Alone. I have to have it over here is because the problem in our society is that we people don't know how to cope with it. People, our society, you know, teaches you what epilepsy is, but who's out there to help us cope with it? And that's why you should, you know, reach out to people and reach out to people who have knowledge in this area that could teach you how to cope with epilepsy because everyone deserves a chance. Everyone deserves to live a happy, healthy, and productive life. And Bob, yeah. can you end it with just just explain to people how they can get in touch with you besides the website, you know, different things that you may offer people and different places that if, if your organization doesn't offer it, that you could direct them to different places to get the help they need? Absolutely. Again, the website is ct-ea.org. They can call us on the phone that's listed on our website. But believe me, we interact with so many other organizations, whether it's uh, drug manufacturers, uh, help support groups that we run, uh, doctors. We've even found doctors for people. Yeah, I must say, I, I've known Bob for over 10 years, and I just love him to death. He has done so much, and you talk about Bob anywhere, and they know who he is, because he is, you know, his whole life, he's been advocating to help people with epilepsy, and we need more people like you, Bob. You know, I really say that you have done, I am so proud of you, uh, all the work that you've done, all the work you've shared with me, you know, um, I, you know, you were, you were, you were teaching, you know, I had some questions about certain issues, and Bob sent me some information to help me and I was like wow he put so much effort and so much time into this stuff I I was so proud of you when you and I asked you to send me some documents over because I needed some help with something and you know thank you I just want to say thank you for everything you do I am just so proud of you and I love everything you do thank you very much and believe me you've helped me with so much too but I appreciate the kind words epilepsy you're not alone and we're all together here control alt delete reset your mind reset your life have that power of positivity thanks again bob and we'll look forward everybody on here comment like share do whatever you want and uh, keep following us and we'll grow from here take care